So welcome back everyone. Tonight we're about to have our updates for our check-in number three from our various teams, from our five teams. Uh, having said that, Dr. Hayden, which team will be leading us off tonight with their presentation? All right. So we had decided to start in reverse alphabetical order, skipping Morehouse <laughs> as we move forward upward. So let's start with our uh, with Team Rams, uh, with Dr. Caldwell and uh, Monini. And you want to share your screen? You have two minutes. Oh, oh I love it. Thank you, Dr. Hayden. Um, can everybody hear up on CV, please? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for allowing us to go first today because uh, actually this is a WSSU homecoming weekend. Uh, weather permitting, we're going to have some big things. Um, All right. So last week, um, our goal was to target um, the course and the applicable HBC, uh, APC tools uh, that we can use in a course. So for that, we were able to actually do exactly that. Uh, we did identify the course and the applicable uh, tools. And um, as my slide here says, the tasks that are completed, we have identified CSE 1311, which is Java programming. It's actually Java programming too, as the course to integrate HPC for spring 2023. Uh, the applicable HBZ resources will just be the, o, the ORNL cluster. So the idea here is here, our students will be introduced to the clusters. They will complete the HBC crash course during the first week of classes. They will learn how to SSH connect to the, um, uh, the clusters through their local clients. Uh, we are thinking we'll probably use party but we will decide on that. They'll be able to manage their directories and use the Vim editor to write their codes, uh, compile and run their Java exercises in the Unix command line environment uh, in the cluster. Uh, the goal week four, which will be our next goal, we are think we are looking at modifying the course outline for the 1311 course we just identified and write down some uh, lab exercises that we intend to uh, use. And then we're gonna look at working on our poster that we're gonna present for the finals. And that's about it. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. Any questions for us or as, as you move forward, any resources that we can uh, provide you? Or... Okay. All right. Can't hear you, Manini. Your lips were moving. Oh, sorry, I was asking Dora Kawa if she has anything or Elijah, but for, for no, me as far as I see. We're good. We have such a dynamic mentor. We're good. Yeah. 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 All right. Good job, Elijah. All right. So our next team would be North, Norfolk State University. All right, I see Dr. Dyke clicking. Yeah. But you are Sounds still on mute. And following her, we'll have North Carolina a and Latasha. Okay. It's not letting me. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, so the basis is I, con I continued from the previous slide that we did before. Um, as I stated before that, 
part of what I wanted to do was to come up with course descriptions for the courses um, and then to also start working on syllabi for those. And so part of that would be to develop the use cases. Um, so what I've um, looked at for spring, and this should be spring 2023, um, the course descriptions uh, I did for the distributed software systems, basically what we'll be covering is parallel and distributed programming platforms, um, algorithms, and design and implementation of distributed systems. Um, the prerequisites I've thought about already, and they include data structures, data communications, operating systems, Unix programming. And the course description for the scientific programming, I'm still working on that. I've interfaced with um, faculty in the chemistry department and in the um, engineering department who will give me some use cases. So I did meet with them, but I just haven't had um, the time and they haven't had time to come up with the use cases. Um, and then, but I did talk to them about what the prerequisite background would need to be, which will be analytical skills, mathematical background, and not necessarily any programming um, knowledge since this will be a first course that they will be taking. Um, and then this is, I came up with my planned list for moving forward. Um, and then, so what I've looked at is the descriptions already um, for the courses. I've started looking at some textbooks and materials. And um, as I stated before, I met with them about the use cases, but hopefully next week I'll be able to present some of those use cases. Okay. Is Sisa not uh, able to provide? Hmm? Examples. Your mentor. I haven't met with him. I, I don't know. You haven't met with him. Mm -mm. And okay, so who is she assigned? The uh, sis, sister. Adene. Go to your first group. Yeah, Adene. Mm -hmm. Do you need uh, contact information from him? Um, I have his email address. Um, Let's see if I have a phone number. I'll look it up and put it in chat if I do. Okay. All right, thank you. Because that's, that's exactly where your use cases should come from. And chemistry is his field. Right, and I remember when we met, he told me about that. Mm -hmm. He's very good. So we'll, we'll uh, see if we can put you in contact with him because he has been here. Today? Not today. Oh, yeah, it's not here today. Oh, yeah, right. We met last time he was here, but he had to leave for something else. And then I met him the first week as well. Okay. We did exchange, I think, Discord contact and um, email. Okay. All right. Sometimes a phone call. Right. Mm, okay. Require. All right. I'll see what I can find on. So let me stop sharing. Thank you. All right. So that was Norfolk State University. The next team would be North Carolina a and and Austin Community College. Okay, let me share our screen. Um, I did um, follow up with Dr. Bullock. Um, we spoke earlier this um, this week and we made a decision even with our mentor that we uh, due to our schedule we're going to meet before our meeting on Thursday um, and that helped and so actually speaking to her it just um, clarified a lot um, I was we were able to make the content that we're going to build a little bit more broad-based that will go into different disciplines um, so we had decided to then instead of focusing on a class, we want to create modules to include different data sets to be implemented in any course. Um, and the focus now that we're looking at is going to be securing data and privacy, um, things of that nature. So we're going to work on doing the research, finding some data sets. John is going to help us. Our mentor has been uh, extremely helpful in this. Um, and then we're going to be able to put more together for our poster and get more of our information ready for our poster. So what is the course again? 
Um, we well first I had initially put it for uh, an accounting course, but then after meeting with Dr. Bullock, we decided that um, we were going to create modules that we can implement into into any class where we're going to talk about uh, data security. Okay, I need you to be a little more specific about that. Okay, so. <laughs> Right, because Dr. Bullock said that she was going to implement it in her um, computer science, like her frameworks class, and then okay. I was going to use it in um, one of my um, accounting classes um, that would be structured around um, accounting information systems, fraud, and auditing. Okay, so why don't you um, pick one, maybe her course. Okay. And, and move forward with it as that being the, the targeted force. Okay. Okay. And whatever you develop will be uh, usable in both those, uh, in both campuses. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. We're going to skip over Morehouse for just a moment and move to Elizabeth City State University. Are they both gone now? No, I'm here, but I don't know. Oh, I see. see. <laughs> okay, gotcha. I, I presented the last week, so our agreement, the other, other one of the team has to present this week. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, I, I, saw, I thought I saw Cheryl on for just a moment. She, she chatted and said she's having network trouble, so she can't um, get connected. Okay, let, let me, okay, let me go. Yeah, here actually, yeah, I, our course is uh, data mining and machine learning. Uh, the course description, uh, yeah, the course will cover uh, the most important data mining and analysis technique, uh, and will provide background knowledge on how to conduct data mining project. Uh, after defining uh, what the knowledge discovery and data mining is, uh, data mining tasks such as classification, uh, clustering, uh, association analysis will be discussed in detail. Uh, basic data analysis techniques, uh, centering on basic visualization technique and statistics to get better understanding of data mining tasks at hand will be covered. Uh, more uh, techniques, how to uh, pre-process a data set for data mining tasks will be introduced. Also, uh, in course project students will uh, obtain hands-on experience in conducting uh, data mining and data analysis projects. Also, uh, in addition, fundamentals of machine learning, such as uh, neural network and deep learning will be introduced. Uh, the implementation schedule, uh, the first two weeks will cover the introduction for data mining and knowledge discovery topics. Uh, the next three weeks, uh, basic concepts and technique for classification will be covered. And the next week after the three weeks, uh, hands-on project using one of the classification technique will be implemented. Uh, the next three weeks, uh, cluster analysis will be covered uh, and discussed. The, the, the next week after hands-on project on one of the clustering technique will be implemented with the students. The next two weeks, a neural network and deep learning fundamental which will be introduced to the students. Next, hands-on uh, project on training and uh, constructing neural network that will be implemented with the students. The next three weeks, association analysis it will be introduced. The last uh, week, actually, hands-on project in association analysis will be implemented with the student. That is the implementation schedule. A goal for week uh, number four, review and finalize course description and the schedule, and also create an eight, uh, high performance computing exercise. That's it. 
Okay, good. So that HPC exercise would be the project at the end, or is that used? Um, Actually, Boyd introduced it with me just now, but he didn't give me detail about it. You know. Okay, all right. Yeah, we, that's we one thing. It. Good. That's one thing we want to clarify is, you know, at what point in the schedule do you need the... Um, Maybe may during for the project. Usually, especially, especially for uh, neural network and deep learning, we, we come up with a model and we have to train the model. So at this point, we can uh, uh, use the high performance uh, computing resources to train our model. Okay. So everyone needs to give consideration to that. You know, do you need one or two exercises, uh, one class project, uh, one homework assignment, you know, just what you want, what you're tagging here and um, for these uh, use cases, but where these use cases will be inserted into the class. You need to think about that. You know, do, do, when you teach this course, do you typically have one big team project? Do you typically have several um, assignments through, throughout the, the semester? Um, do you need small homework assignments? Um, you know, how, how do you usually, um, you know, how will you use these to evaluate the students' performance? All right, thank you for that. Thank you. You're welcome. Is Morehouse ready? Morehouse is ready. Morehouse is ready. Good evening, everyone. Hi. Hi. Mal Watkins, uh, been away. Uh, international travel took me away to Israel and Egypt. So I'm sorry I missed the earlier sessions. Um, Yvonne Phillips was here in my stead or uh, holding it down while I was away. And so she has shared with me uh, what um, the earlier sessions developed. And so I've taken that slide and made some modifications today to share with you uh, that one of the tasks that was completed was the selection of which course to focus on uh, for applying HPC. And that's the data science one, which is a new revamp of an old course. Um, it's got a new number 411 uh, for uh, data information reasons. We chose 411 as the uh, course number. And the target first launch is spring 2023. Uh, Got to cross some hurdles to get there, but we think we're in good shape. Uh, number two, we've decided R as the programming language uh, that will be used in that course. And um, syllabus for that course has been drafted and is currently under review because the course itself is part of the data science and analytics minor proposal uh, that we are planning to put forward at Morehouse. That said, um, in looking at the syllabus, there are several opportunities, uh, several modules within that syllabus where HPC could be applied. Uh, and so our goal is to narrow that down into which of the modules um, we will focus on as a um, project for this hackathon. Uh, so we're going to get Data Science Initiative also, which is here in the Atlanta University Center to assist us in enrolling students in the HPCC crash course, which I believe is going to be held in December, uh, December 13th. And also um, we're creating modules or uh, part of our curriculum to implement a tree-based model using a cluster. And that would be one of the modules in the 411 course. Uh, that's what I have. Great. Implement. Great, great, great. I'm matching your slide. I don't know if you got it. 
Ah, nice, nice. <laughs> Nice to be in sync with you. <laughs> in sync. All right. Well, thank you for that information. And your mentor is? Veronica. Okay, Veronica. You're in good hands. All right, so that concludes our reporting section of uh, this uh, check-in. I appreciate the effort that everyone is bringing to this. I think yeah, just continue to uh, think through your courses uh, in terms of how you're going to structure them. Uh, it looks like you're off to a good start, uh, and I think you'll have something very effective um, to present to your students in the spring. All right. So at this point, we want to, if there are no further questions or comments, then why don't we go over to, uh, to, why don't I turn this over to Boyd for his training session. Okay, do we wanna stop video <clears throat> so you don't have to edit Jamie or do you wanna just keep rolling? Actually, that doesn't sound you like, no, well, the, the last one I actually had is one big one, so that's fine. We can, we can keep on rolling. Keep on rolling. Keep on trucking. <laughs> All right. Let me share my screen. I feel like he's partial for some reason. <laughs> Who's partial? Me partial? Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at your background. I feel like he's partial to a team, but I might be wrong. I don't know. <laughs> I have to match it with my... So I wanted to spend some time talking today was cloudy cluster and like how to do HPC in the cloud in the classroom, but also give an overview of Quick Labs, which might provide some resources that people are unaware of that are available and how to get them at no charge from Google. Um, so let's go ahead and proceed. So first thing I wanted to do is just quickly give an overview of what cloudy cluster does. We'll get into a little more detail later. Um, but the whole concept behind Cloudy Cluster is to create a familiar, secure, fully operational HPC cluster in minutes in Google Cloud or in AWS. And just like, you know, a, a mini version of what's at ORNL, you can submit jobs to it. Um, there's some caveats since it's the cloud. And you, you do have to worry about how to fund it because, the you know, the cloud providers don't provide stuff for free unless you go through some right. hoops to do some things. So, so we'll go through some of those as well. But, the, but that's the whole concept behind here. Um, things people do with Cloudy Cluster are things people that have, that have done. Um, we've done some large um, hurricane traffic simulations, which is kind of pertinent. I'm hoping I can get home tomorrow, heading back to Atlanta. I think the storm's turning away. We'll just hit some rain driving back from Atlanta. Luckily, we're not going into Greenville. And so, we, so this was a project where they we took and ran 2.1 million vCPUs in a um, pleasingly parallel job to kind of process video clips for traffic analytics and we're able to do some pretty cool stuff and we're actually using a lot of this data for machine learning in our next version of our traffic vision product another interesting scaling project we did was this is an NLP or natural language processing project where we did 1.1 million vCPUs this one actually preceded the other one, and it was done in AWS with uh, Clemson University. Both of these are done with the, the Dice Lab at Clemson University. And the goal here was to, to take um, text from a massive number of scholarly articles, and I can't remember the topic right this second, but then look at them and, and tune and do a whole parameter sweep of various different tunings to see what you could really get out of it. So that, that was that was very interesting. Another project is doing some cryoEM using the Relion codes. And this was introduced as part of the Cloudify program through SGCI. And we worked with the CN Froco lab at University of Michigan to do some pretty interesting um, high resolution cryoEM image processing. Another one more recent, you know, it's coming up this year was a tapas project. Um, 
with Sean Cleveland and Eric Lamb was a student and Joe Stubbs helped out. And anyway, you, you see all the people there. And this was an interesting project to use Cloudy Cluster to automatically spin up an HPC environment and be able to use it through Tapas directly if you wanted to, you know, if you wanted to have some load issues or if you wanted to have some maintenance on your system, you could go spin it and connect it directly to Cloudy Cluster, interesting project. Rutgers does some very interesting work with um, Cloudy Cluster trying to just make it available. Um, and there's certain projects that just don't work as well on their on-prem system and they take them up to the cloud and they can also take advantage of credits from strides and other things through the NIH. There's some stuff we did with Caltech. What's interesting is the faculty member here, Walker, Walter Landry, actually went off. He's working at SpaceX now, but that was a very interesting kind of scaling, just showing how compared to on-prem, the cloud can do a certain code scaling at you know smaller scale. Not not we're not to massive scale yet because they don't have the infinite band, at least in Google or AWS. Um, we did some stuff with the Naval Research Lab, um, turbo wave modeling. And one of the other projects we did with Science Gateways Community Institute was to work with the open on demand team out of um, Ohio State and University of Buffalo and Virginia Tech to get open on demand working as a part of Cloudy Cluster. And, and actually, as that project evolved, we actually open on demand as a, a default part that comes up with Cloudy Cluster now. So you can use it straight out of the box. So that's interesting. So one of the things we do with Cloudy Cluster is we really try to give you the ability to run those HPC jobs. Um, one of the things that we do is have a meta scheduler. And one of the things in an HPC environment, you have traditional um, instances or you know, think compute nodes or resources that you access. You have the login node, generally what you do is you log into that and that's where you submit your jobs. And then there's a scheduler, and the scheduler is responsible for taking all the running instances that are, you know, in an on-prem cluster and allocating which nodes get to run which jobs in what order, trying to optimize throughput, but still maintaining priority. Um, in the cloud, that's a little bit different because you have you get to spin up those resources dynamically. They aren't running all the time. So it's where we have the meta scheduler that spins it up and then it hands it off to, to Torque or Slurm, whichever is behind the scenes. And then there's usually a parallel file system and there, there's some other networking and resources and things around that. And a lot of standard libraries and HPC tools are provided as part of the default image. It's available in the marketplace, Google and AWS. And you can also download one of those and customize it and put custom code on that you want. So, so let's kind of give you an overview of what things that happen. Um, and that was an extra slide that didn't need to be there. <laughs> Quick Labs. Um, a little bit of overview of what Quick Labs is. Now, Quick Labs was purchased by Google, and it was this learning pathway where you can go in and run courses and work with them online and they have exercises and then you get the results. So it's, it's really good hands-on way to get access to cloud and machine learning and other types of resources without having to, you know, do anything else. And a lot of the setup is automated. A lot of the guardrails are put on to, to really step people through that. So, so we actually developed a quick labs course with Google on cloudy cluster and I actually have some free tokens um, for that. We'll go into that in a minute. But if you know, is, if anyone wants to try this out, they actually gave us tokens to hand out to let people try. They expire, I think, in December. Um, but there's lots of other content out here, and <clears throat> you know, you, there's database engineers, there's DevOps. You know, if you want to do machine learning, there's learning paths. And, and these learning paths actually have multiple courses that take you through that path. And one of the things that a lot of people don't know about is for academic institutions 
and, and even research institutions that you know that are nonprofit, you can go through and get various different types of credits. So, so there's two different things which can be confusing. There's Quick Labs credits, which are over here on the far right, the training credits. And if, if you read down there, you know, a faculty can apply for 5,000 Quick Lab credits. Um, and for an example, the Cloudy Cluster Quick Lab costs you one credit. So you can actually have lots of runs and lots of iterations with students with that. You know, a student can go get 200 credits on their own. And then, um, and if you do work with courses, th there's ways to have those renew. They do expire at the end of the year, um, but but those are ways to do that within Quick Labs. Now, there's also research credits. Well, well, we'll go to the credits for learning. So, if you if you're wanting to use Google Cloud Platform. To work with that, you, you can also do $100 in GCP credits and $50 per student for smaller projects. And if you tie it to research, um, you can actually get $5,000. And, and all these credits generally expire in a year, but you can have $5,000. And what they'd want on the research side is you know, a, a write up at the end. And then if you have another project the next year that, you know, that, that they're willing to do those things, especially if it's applied to classes or those types of things. And then there's some career advancement types of things you can do as well. So there's the link there and we'll obviously share the slides later, but th there are these resources that help um, let you enable it in the classroom. So here again is kind of the highlight to the, the link to, to get the credits, um, more detail focusing on the, the Cloud Skill Boost ones. And this is a screenshot of the, the, the one we have, we built for Cloudy Cluster. And what I wanted to kind of walk through is just kind of show you briefly what that looks like if my hotel internet holds up. And I won't walk through this and do this. Any, anyone's welcome to, if you click on start lab, there's those little, I have codes that will let you type in a code and let you use that lab one time. And I can, you know, give multiples and people can go through this and, and look at that. And then if you have lots of those credits available for a class or those types of things, you can give the code to a class. Um, and they have other things they can do as well. So there's, there's, What's interesting about this is you get some experience in this lab setting up the cloud environment. And you know, the, with Google Cloud or AWS, you end up with just you know a, a billing account or those types of things. That's all kind of handled behind the scenes in the quick lab. But then you're given a project. And inside this project, you can do a plethora of things. And one of the things that you know this lab talks you through is how to do, um, specifically high performance computing with cloudy cluster. And so you, you go through, you learn about the G cloud shell, which is just like an SSH instance in the console to a specific, um, little instance that's running. And then you run some commands and then that enables you to do those things that then you create things like SSH keys, you expose your students to that in the console. And then there's a script you have to run to automatically set up all the permissions inside Google Cloud. And, and it's pretty much copy and paste. So it's pretty straightforward. And then you go through the process of actually launching an instance, which will be the con control instance for Cloudy Cluster. And then it walks you through the steps of finishing that environment all the way to you know, adding your user information, and then finally, you get to create your HPC environment where you get to choose the size of your login node um, and your scratch storage and, and other things. And the one thing you want to make sure is you follow the guidelines here because they have these guardrails um, that you have to do exactly what they say. If you go over, they don't want people mining Bitcoin, so they're very restrictive on what you can do. And if you follow this exactly, they, you know, they, they fit right in. So you go through this. And then it takes about 15 minutes 
um, to, to bring up that environment. And then while, while you're doing that, you can actually watch a behind the scenes video. It explains all the infrastructure that's automatically provisioned and set up and how all that happens. So it's a, it's a good exercise. That's also on YouTube. And then you actually go in and you log into Open On Demand. And just to give you a little idea um, what Open On Demand looks like, So here's open on demand. And I actually launched two um, scientific or engineering kind of workstation instances through open on demand. So one of them actually, and how you do that, just so you know, and you could actually do this as part of that quick lab if you run out, if you if you have enough time. So that, that there's the that time limit up there that you know, if, if you roll through it, you still have some time, you can actually play with it as long as you don't see the number of instances and we actually tested this up at um university of british columbia a few weeks ago and what's interesting is so if you want to see what a you know a linux desktop running in the cloud you can have a full gui linux desktop so that you can run in and interact with with anything ssh and you, you basically have a full you know linux workstation and you know in some places that use open on demand, they'll actually have several of these run at once. Obviously, not in a quick labs environment because you'll run over the limits, but in a regular um, cloud environment or even in an on prem environment that uses open on demand, you know, you, you can bring your class through and they can all interact and, and you can, you know, launch the different types of nodes you want. You can also kind of lock it down and have specific apps. So here's Jupyter Lab. And it's running on a different instance that spun up automatically. And so you can see here's, you know, Jupyter Labs. So you can go in and configure whatever you want, you know, create your notebook and type in your hello world or, or, or whatever. And so those things are available. When, to launch an environment or, you know, let's say I want a cloudy desktop, you go in here and say, I want it to run for this many hours. This is the instance type. If you want to do some parallel things, you can launch the number of instances, and then you have some optional GPUs. Um, the, again, in the Quick Labs environment, you wouldn't be able to run that, but if you launched it in a native environment, you, you, you could do some of those things. And it's nice that they have a time limit, so you won't leave those things running for a month and then you know burn up all your credits or, or other things like that. So that's very useful. Now, you also, you know, all of, Open on demand is using HPC job scripts behind the scenes to do this. So you see, there's one I launched earlier. And so here's these two instances that are launched and running. They're using an HPC job. And th this is all just wrapped as part of open on demand. So you can interact and see that. Um, you also can, you know, SSH into the login node just like a normal cluster. You can look at the jobs. There's there's the output of the jobs running using the CCQ stat, which is the meta scheduler. And, and in the quick lab, it kind of shows you how all that works. And so, so that gives you an idea of some of the things that you can do with open on demand. There's even ways to wrap other apps. Um, it's, it's really a powerful tool. It's all running on top of cloudy cluster and, and you can do those types of things. And one of the things I wanted to mention is when you're doing this, this, you know, cloud boost, you want to make sure that you have an incognito window because when you hit start, it's going to give you credentials to log into Google Cloud as a specific user. And you don't want to accidentally, Google will sometimes switch your Gmail user to whatever, to whatever. So if you copy those credentials and paste them and come over here, and do it in an incognito window, then it won't switch from you and everything will flow through very properly. Um, and, and also make sure you follow the names of things and the numbers exactly. And if and if anyone wants to try a quick lab, um, again, I have little tokens that you can run through and do it and they'll, they'll be good through December. You can have a you know a few if you wanted to, to share them. They were, they were nice enough to give us some. And that's a, the, the behind the scenes video and that's, that's the presentation. So 
Any questions? I do want to put out there that um, if there are ones out there that want to step through the process of setting up a cloudy cluster and, and Google Cloud, because it takes a little bit of time. I'm, I'm not going to get you. It's going to take, what would you say, Boyd, about 45 minutes-ish to an hour to set up a, your uh, own instance? Yeah, I mean, you could do it as fast as 30 minutes, but the first time through, yeah, 45 minutes is probably a good good and, and and yeah we're willing to help go through the first time we can set up a little side session right and and as well as the uh there's a video of us stepping through that process during the admin 22 so this past march admin 22 uh, uh symposium that can walk you through as well and that link is on the main site under resources yeah and and that actually took a little bit of time, and that's before we learned. You know, we didn't have everyone in an incognito window, and people were switching out. So that, that, that's where some of the tips and tricks come from. Mm -hmm. Boy, this is Al. I was wondering: is it easy for two teammates to share an instance or be able to view the work um, and collaborate? Yeah. yeah. If if if, if if you want to use something for the hackathon, we can also spin up a version in our own in our own project, so you're not limited by the Quick Labs um, as well. If, and that would be easier to to share if you'd like. We we can just give me a heads up, and we can spin that up. Thanks. Now again, this is the time that we can we can ask some of those those uh, deeper questions here. Uh, everyone hasn't used a cluster before or or anything like that, so I'm going to ask. Uh, uh, I'm actually going to ask Boyd a very common thing that we've done. Um, could you show um, Jupyter notebooks? So what we we displayed in our previous training session, Jupyter notebooks inside of Cloudy Cluster and then inside of the AI platform. That way they can see it both ways, depending upon which way they wanna go. So the AI platform, you're gonna to have to remind me the link of that one, but-, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I search for it just like you do. No, if you go to the, uh, if you go to the marketplace and just, not the marketplace, but the um, dashboard and just type in AI platform, it, it yeah, so, so we have to launch that instance as well to get that to come up. That'll take yes. a few minutes. Um, so these are two different ways just to kind of give you some ideas. Uh, marketplace. I think it's just, just playing AI platform instead of a Google AI platform. There we go. Yep. So uh, Boyd here has gone to Google Cloud uh, or cloud.google.com. In the search bar, he just typed in AI platform. And then it says, uh, go to platform. So yours may say enable first. So you click enable and then you go to uh, go to application. And I believe then it is just. And then you get to migrate to Vertex because I've used it before I get to migrate to Vertex. Ah, uh, okay. Well, you know what, we'll just go. I don't need to migrate. Okay. Whatever's there is there. It doesn't matter. Um, then you pick your, oh, yeah. you have to enable the API. They have changed a little bit. Every once in a while, Google changes names, the names of things. So that's yeah. where we get to see. And all the cloud providers do. Every time you go back every month, something's going to be a little different. So you have to kind of look around. All right. And what's in here, hopefully they still have the button. There was a button that used to be here that just said, open new notebook. And now let's see if they have changed that. I'll prepare your data. So there's create a data set. Oh, yeah, this is all new. Yeah, they have adjusted everything again. <laughs> That's wonderful. 
Okay, sorry about that. Let's um, go back to the cloudy cluster way. You can probably type in Jupiter though. I, I guess we could look at Colab too, would be another option. Um, oh, we, well we did, so we should be able to, should be. Yeah, you, you already did that, so. Mm -hmm. So sorry yeah. They took out the easy button, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so, so when you go to interactive apps, you can launch, oh, this is, we got code server, that's not in the main release, but that, that's a new project we're getting working. Um, so this is Jupyter, and you could just spin it up, and you hit launch for how many hours you want, the type of instance you want, and then since I already did this, you know, Jupyter's running like this. Now, what's nice is everything is stored in the, the home directory of that user. So you, you can actually, um, if, you know, share between things, or if you both log in as the same user, then you can kind of see it. Just make sure you don't, you know, you're saving, you don't step on each other. Um, that, that's one of the easy ways. That's one of the things we're work, going to be working with Harvard Business School is to allow for more collaboration. It's a project coming in the next year through open on demand. Um, but so here you go. And, and and just like, you know, normal, and I y'all have seen Jupiter. I mean, th this all works the same and it saves. Um, and, and you're ready to go. So I, I don't, And so, yeah, and, and when you hit, so what's also very interesting, if um, I just, I'm gonna grab a random thing, actually, let's grab something interesting. Give me one second. You know, when you get a new computer sometimes, anyway, I thought I had some interesting notebooks. I actually have a notebook um, where you can actually submit HPC jobs um, and and then do the results. And I was trying to find it, but it's off in GitHub somewhere. So I won't make you wait for that. Um, Ooh. Oh, maybe let's look at that one real quick. There we go. So, so I'm going to drag in. So I'm dragging in this notebook and you can just drag and drop from your desktop into the notebook and then i'm opening up this notebook and this is grabbing the first code i found um but this gives you an idea so i'm importing the ccq client um did pretty print just because it's nice importing widgets and then as you go through, you you execute, and this might all just blow up in my face because I just went and grabbed a random version. And well, you know what? I know that's not gonna. Yeah. So first off, we'll need to switch that to. It's not way too much detail for a Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> Wednesday? Did I miss a day? Is it Thursday? Yeah, see, it's it's still Wednesday for me. <laughs> somebody, missed, somebody missed a day. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly why I was laughing. I was thinking, oh, poor, poor, poor boy. <laughs> <laughs> we we understand and that just punctuated it yeah that's right 
<laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to make you. I'm not going to make you debug random code. I just grabbed off of a, a, a local file search. Um, but you get the concept here. And, and and there's actually I probably don't have the CCQ client installed. The, the more I think about it, and it's out in GitHub. But this will actually allow you to list jobs and do things and create jobs. Um, you can actually launch and create jobs through Cloudy Cluster from a, a Python notebook, um, which is kind of fun. And then you can go and grab the results. You know, if you have the results output to this directory, they can show up here and then you can visualize them. So it's kind of a cool little loop that you can do. Um, and so anyway, but that that's how you would edit and you would be much more elegant and yours would work the first time because you know which one you grab. But <laughs> So I got a question here for you, Boyd. Um, if I access Jupyter by way of your cloudy cluster, and tomorrow I, ask, I access Jupyter by way of Google Cloud, are these two different platforms or is it the same guy I'm dealing with? So Jupyter is probably a very similar version. Um, so, so Jupyter will be there, but some of the capabilities um, I mean, it sh it should work. I mean, if you use Google Cloud and you're going into the AI training, you know, you're going through a different, a little bit different. If you're going through Google Colab, you know, things are a little bit different and stuff doesn't stay. If you're in cloudy cluster and that cloudy cluster environment stays around, um, you know, everything's stored in your home directory like it would be on a, you know, a you know, a normal HPC system. So probably it's like a normal HPC system version versus uh you know kind of the, the the cloud providers have their own you know very implementations of jupiter and this is more of a you know that that version does that help and you can you know mo most notebooks you can grab and use on most of the platforms unless you're doing something very specific but the above the google is that correct is Cloudy Cluster a Google item? So, so what, what Cloudy Cluster does is it runs inside of Google Cloud, but it makes an HPC environment um, that looks like ORLNL or TAC or, you know, it, it, it looks, you know, it's a smaller version, but it looks and kind of feels like that HPC environment um, within Google Cloud. And it also does the same thing in AWS Cloud, but it, but it's, something that we wrote to run on Google or AWS. It's not something that Google wrote, if, if that makes sense. We partner with Google that, you know, that we, we help do stuff with it, but it's a little bit different than some of the machine learning platforms or the other platforms. I mean, if you go to, um, you know, all of these things are available in Google Cloud and there's just as many, if not more, in, in, in the other clouds. And so you can have a Kubernetes engine, you know, you can actually do VMware engines from this, um, all the way down to big table, data store, you can do database things. Um, and so, so there's lots of stuff. And what we've done with Cloudy Cluster is take a, a lot of those basic resources to make an HPC environment. And some of the other environments like the, the, the AI platform and other pieces, you can, you know, th that's more specific for AI and it doesn't really think about HPC. Does that make sense? Yeah, it sure does. So any other questions? I, I'm also gonna put out there for some of the professors. I know you all, it, it is, again, it is Thursday <laughs> and it is late in the day. Um, you mentioned it, but I just wanna get into it a little bit more. Let's say that Dr. K is going to uh, add this to his class next semester. And he wants to use Google Cloud and or a uh, cloudy cluster in order to facilitate his class. Um, there is a cost associated with it if you just outright set up an, a, an account and then went for it. 
if he wanted to to receive some type of sponsorship or research grant or something like that from Google, what would he need to do? Yeah, and, and the big thing is go to these, you know, figure out which one of these research credits or credits for learning or training credits fit, um, you know, the, the use case of what you're trying to do for, for the class. And then, and the training credits are specific for Quick Labs. So you can go to Quick Labs, um, just to give you an example. And there's all these different, so there's a Vertex AI Quick, you know, Jamie and I didn't know how to start with that. So we could actually go and do a Vertex AI Quick Start and it would teach us how to do that. And if I clicked on Start the Lab, you know, we're gonna have to, then this one costs five credits and you can usually get, but if you get 5,000 of those, you can go do that. Um, and you can also launch it with a token and that, that, that's the tokens we have. So we can put the, you know, the, the tokens in there, the tokens we have are for cloudy cluster, but you can go learn these various different aspects and, and have them go through an exercise like this to learn it. Um, and then you can go through and use then you can go use either the research credits if it's associated with the research project or you know go to the learning credits where you go to the actual gcp and this gives you a hundred dollars um or fifty dollars per student or if it's associated with a research project you can get five thousand dollars of real money in google cloud that then you can use in the class form so so there's a little more work to, to go do those things but once you have it you're giving your students experience in the cloud with whatever you want to teach. Um, I can also throw out there that those of you that saw my easy button back in the day when I would just hit, it is now back in the day. It, it worked in March um, <laughs> for, for uh, Vertex um, or what used to be uh, Google Cloud AI. Apparently, the reason they changed is because with platform AI, you had a limited set of uh, uh, virtual machines you could create. And so they adjusted that uh, to now utilize uh, this Vertex product so that although a little bit more interesting, of course, there are the quick labs for that, it allows you a lot more uh, the word that's in my vocabulary, granularity, in other words, you're able to, to set up different uh, networks and um, add different GPUs and things like that to the instances as you need them. So it's a, it's a little pain sometimes, but uh, the fact is when they add some of these features, sometimes it, it is warranted. And it looks like in this case, it is actually warranted. Still going to figure out how to do it because you know, easy button. <laughs> That's right. So, Mr. Boyd, who is your competitor? Um. So we do. There's manual ways to bring up HPC clusters. Um. In Google Cloud, you can use, um, they have an HPC toolkit where you, it's a little more manual process to bring up an HPC environment, Slurm environment. And, and so, so that, that's kind of a competitor. It doesn't have a UI, it doesn't have open on demand, doesn't have the, those capabilities out of the box. You'd have to install all of that. Um, the, the other one probably is an AWS. Each cloud provider has their own kind of more manual way to bring up an HPC system. So that, that those are probably our competitors. There's also Rescale, um, but Rescale is more targeted for specific codes and they help you bring those along. It's not really that infrastructure as a service. And you know, we've tried to fit within that infrastructure as a service and, and provide something. So that, that's that, that those are probably the, the ones we run into the most or the, the ones that are kind of default for each different cloud. Parallel cluster is, is on, AWS um, HPC toolkit on Google and 
forget the one on, and we're not on Azure, but but there's something similar on Azure as well. We're not on Azure yet. I'm thinking Oracle's gonna, Oracle's new product is gonna add something at some point. They actually, Oracle does have kind of a manual one that looks a lot like the Google one. Mm -hmm. um, it uses Terraform to kind of have an environment and then uses the, the power on power off scripts inside a slurm to kind of turn on and turn off VMs for comp computation. And again, this uh, Boyd is a wealth of information when it comes to this. For the practical application into your classroom, there are going to be challenges. There are. Yes. Uh, for you to use these, please utilize uh, Boyd expertise and um, and Omnibond in order to assist you. So I promise you, you will not find another company that will be a, a, a greater uh, advantage and help to you than figuring these things out. And again, it can get very, very complicated. I dare even say get complicated for no reason. I don't know why, <laughs> but I, I digress. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and again, for this, if, if somebody wants to use Cloudy Cluster just for this hackathon, we can spin something up so you can get familiar with it. And that's not, you know, so we don't have to go through all those other steps, but to, to scale it up for a class, you probably have to go through those other things and make sure you're comfortable with it. But we don't want someone to go down a path that, I mean, I, I actually was a computer science education graduate, went, went into industry, but um, I, I taught computer science at the high school level for, you know, at least my student teaching. So I, I know a little bit what it's like, not at the, the university level, although I have taught some classes there, but not some of those introductory type things. So anyway, I have a little bit of understanding the pain of stuff flopping in classes. <laughs> All right, if there are no more questions, Boyd, thank you very much. Um, we appreciate you and, and Omnibon assisting us as always. Um, of course, giving up your time to, to also be a, 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 a mentor. And of course, I'm going to work you to death for uh, HPC in the city as well. <laughs> but with that, I'll actually end the recording and hand the floor back over to Dr. Hayden. Okay.